to you, all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you, and worthily magnify your holy name, through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Glory to God in the highest. And, and peace to his people on earth. Lord God, heavenly King, Almighty God and Father, we worship you, we give you thanks, we praise you for your glory. Lord Jesus Christ, only Son of the Father, Lord God, Lamb of God, you take away the sins of the world. Have mercy on us. You are seated at the right hand of the Father. Receive our prayer. For you alone are the Holy One. You alone are the Lord. You alone are the Most High, Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit. In the glory of God the Father. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Almighty God, you have poured upon us the new light of your incarnate word. Grant that this light, enkindled in our hearts, may shine forth in our lives. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. A reading from the book of the prophet Isaiah. I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My whole being shall exult in my God. For he has clothed me with the garments of salvation. He has covered me with the robe of righteousness, as a bridegroom decks himself with a garland, and as a bride adorns herself with jewels. For as the earth brings forth its shoots, and as a garden causes what is sown in it to spring up, so the Lord God will cause righteousness and praise to spring up before all the nations. For Zion's sake I will not keep silent, and for Jerusalem's sake I will not rest, until her vindication shines out like the dawn, and her salvation like a burning torch. The nations shall see your vindication, and all the kings your glory, and you shall be called by a new name that the mouth of the Lord will give. You shall be a crown of beauty in the hand of the Lord, and a royal diadem in the hand of your God. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Hallelujah. How good it is to sing praises to our God. How pleasant it is to honor him with praise. The Lord rebuilds Jerusalem. He gathers the exiles of Israel. He heals the brokenhearted and binds up their wounds. He counts the number of the stars and calls them all by their names. Great is our Lord and mighty in power. There is no limit to his wisdom. The Lord lifts up the lowly, but casts the wicked to the ground. Sing to the Lord with thanksgiving. Make music to our God upon the harp. He covers the heavens with clouds, and prepares rain for the earth. He makes grass to grow upon the mountains, and green plants to serve mankind. He provides food for flocks and herds, and for the young ravens when they cry. He is not impressed by the might of a horse. He has no pleasure in the strength of a man. But the Lord has pleasure in those who fear him, in those who await his gracious favor. Worship the Lord of Jerusalem. Praise your God of Zion. For he has strengthened the bars of your gates. He has blessed your children within you. He has established peace on your borders. He satisfies you with the finest wheat. He sends out his command to the earth, and his word runs very swiftly. He gives snow like wool. He scatters hoarfrost like ashes. He scatters his hail like breadcrumbs, who can stand against his cold. He sends forth his wind and melts them, and he blows with his wind and the waters flow. He declares his word to Jacob, his statutes and his judgments to Israel. He has not done so to any other nation. To them he has not revealed his judgments. Hallelujah.
A reading from the Epistle of St. Paul to the Galatians. Now before faith came, we were imprisoned and guarded under the law until faith would be revealed. Therefore the law was our disciplinarian until Christ came, so that we might be justified by faith. But now that faith has come, we are no longer subject to a disciplinarian. But when the fullness of time had come, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under the law, in order to redeem those who were under the law, so that we might receive adoption as children. And because you are children, God has sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. So you are no longer a slave, but a child. And if a child, then also an heir through God. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. shines in the darkness, 
and the darkness did not overcome it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to testify to the light, so that all might believe through him. He himself was not the light, but he came to testify to the light. The true light, which enlightens everyone, was coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world came into being through him, yet the world did not know him. He came to what was his own, and his own people did not accept him. But to all who received him, who believed in his name, he gave power to become children of God, who were born not of blood, or of the will of the flesh, or of the will of man, but of God. And the Word became flesh, and lived among us. And we have seen his glory, the glory as of a father's only son, full of grace and truth. John testified to him and cried out, This was he of whom I said, He who comes after me ranks ahead of me, because he was before me. From his fullness we have all received grace upon grace. The law indeed was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God. It is God, the only Son, who is close to the Father's heart, who has made him known. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. On Thursday night, we heard again that wonderful account of Christ's birth from St. Luke's Gospel, the story we most closely associate with Christmas, at least many of us do. Perhaps uh, it's an effect of growing up with the uh, Peanuts Charlie Brown Christmas special and uh, seeing every year Linus come out to remind the children the real meaning of Christmas. But today, just a few days later, on the Sunday within the octave, we are asked to back up more than a little bit. Um, we have, as the Church, never been much for sticking uh, to the chronological account strictly as we wend our way through uh, the Gospels during the liturgical year. So today we're asked to consider not just the beginning of uh, the story of Christmas, not just the backstory, but the beginning of all things. In the beginning, that is, before time, was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God, all things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. One wonders uh, how the first Christians to hear this account of the Christmas story may have reacted. Uh, keep in mind that John's Gospel is believed to have been, been written later uh, than the other what we call synoptic Gospels of Matthew, Mark, and Luke. I tend to think it's not written that much later than the others but certainly probably sometime later. And so it's entirely possible that this story's first audience had heard the beautiful account from Luke that we heard just the other night, and the rousing tale of adventure and political intrigue from Matthew that we'll hear next week. But here there aren't shepherds and mangers and angels. Like there literally is right here, but not in the text. There aren't magi from the east following yonder star, uh, which is just out of camera uh, 
for you, but I assure you they're there, but they're not in the reading. Uh, nor do we uh, hear about wicked Herod plotting his foul scheme. There's something much different going on in the prologue of John's Gospel, something with remarkable theological depth, something which is, to be honest, potentially rather baffling. So over the last four and a half years, you've all been subjected to my little Greek lessons during sermons. Um, and it's okay if you don't remember what many of those words that I introduce to you are. Uh, I, I trust that the point is remembered somewhere in uh, one's heart or subconscious. But there is one Greek word everyone should know. And it's the word that shows up time and time again in this morning's reading from John. That word is logos. It's the word that's translated as word throughout, uh, throughout the gospel reading. Um, you've seen this word before as a uh, suffix in English words, meaning uh, talk in the sense of a subject matter. So theology is talk about God and technology is uh, talk about skill or science. So, so logos has something to do with discourse, but it means more than just that. In the beginning was the discourse, and the discourse was with God, and the discourse was God doesn't make a lot of sense, uh, nor is it particularly moving unless you're a postmodern philosopher. Presumably. But if you think about our translation of this, in the beginning was the word, etc., that doesn't make a whole lot of sense on its face either. We're just used to hearing it. So there's another word in English we get from logos. This won't surprise many of you. It's the word logic. Uh, now, back in my undergraduate years, I had to take a couple of semesters of logic. And it was mostly about uh, translating tautological uh, statements uh, from English into little symbols and things like that. Um, and it was, in the end, a beneficial exercise and necessary to go on in my studies. But that's not all we mean when we use the word logic, is it? It's not all, you know, if all, if all men are mortal and Socrates is a man and Socrates is mortal. It goes beyond that. We, we also say, don't we, that a, an exercise or a structure contains a certain logic or that it doesn't. By this, we mean that there's a certain elegance to a thing, whether it's uh, an argument or a work of art. Uh, or uh, a game. Uh, we use logic in this sense to mean elegance and order, a quality uh, held by something that's intuitive, something we can wrap our minds around. And I think this sense gets us closer to an understanding of John's use of the word logos. So in the beginning, there was some ordering principle something by which the cosmos came to make sense to all hang together, as it were. It's not merely chaos. And that principle of order and elegance was with God, and in some sense was God. Now, I suspect that a particle physicist or a mathematician no matter how agnostic he or she is on the question of God, would have to say that our universe does hold some beautiful examples of order. The complexity of creation is startling, uh, but at its heart is an elegant intuitiveness. As Christians, we can find meaning in what we believe to be a creative order, created order, rather. This isn't about um, sort of becoming anti-intellectual and adopting some kind of Ken Ham 
uh, creation museum approach to the universe. Uh, that's uh, to dumb down, I think, the beauty of how God does interact with his own creation. As complex as the processes that got us here are, from however a tiny singularity expanded into the known universe, to the finer points of how different species have evolved, to even the development of human consciousness and moral sensibility, to which there is, uh, I think, necessarily both a naturalistic and a divine component. Those processes can, I think, be seen in a theological framework in the final analysis as having been governed by or grounded in some kind of divinely instituted order. Providence is another word. And so that brings us back to the logos, this ordering principle, as it relates to the Christmas story. Because, believe it or not, there is a connection and there is a point to all this. While the great majority of the cosmos behaves in ways that are at least theoretically predictable, human will seems a somehow less elegant creation. Now, there are some uh, materialists who would claim, no, if you could uh, figure out exactly how the neurons are firing and exactly how the subatomic particles in those neurons are behaving, you can predict every single thing uh, we're ever going to do, uh, which leads to a moral determinism uh, as well as a natural one, and that's another issue. I don't think the universe of the human spirit behaves in that way. Um, this isn't because we were made any less perfectly than the physical world in which we find ourselves. Quite to the contrary, so perfect a creation is the human being that he can rebel against the order of things, that he can choose disorder. Uh, we have been given free will, and thus we can sin, and indeed have fallen into it. And then a few verses into John's prologue, we discover precisely not just what, but whom the Logos, the order and principle of creation, is. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, full of grace and truth. We have beheld his glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father. John tells us that this force which gave order to everything has become that which we seem to think of as disorder, or at least that which has rebelled against order, a human being, a baby in a manger. I think a baby is probably a pretty chaotic creation to begin with, uh, but one who would grow into a man. And though without the stain of original sin, the rest of us have inherited, nonetheless, in his humanity, though not in his divinity, but in his humanity, just as much a creature as us. Thus, the possibility of a new order among rebellious humanity was made real, was made flesh and blood. To all who received him, John continues, who believed in his name, he became power to become children of God, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. We are offered, by God's grace, regeneration, rebirth, through the sacrament of baptism, which is not a mere symbol but an objective means of transformation. And this new birth is only possible because of that first birth of order himself in Bethlehem. In that glorious sacrament, we are made new creations and given a chance to set aside our inordinate desire in favor of the particular and perfect logic of God's will.
the Logos, by which he ordered all things. In more simple terms, we are able to follow Christ, the pattern by which we were originally created. And this is the greatest Christmas gift any of us could ask for. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, life from life, true God from true God, begotten not made, of one being with the Father, through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, by the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate for the Virgin Mary, and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again, in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven, and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son, he is worshipped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy, Catholic, and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Father, we pray for your holy Catholic Church, that we all may be one. Grant that every member of the Church may truly and humbly serve you, and that your name may be glorified by all people. We pray for all bishops, priests, and deacons, that they may be faithful ministers of your word and sacraments. We pray for all who govern and hold authority in the nations of the world, that there may be justice and peace on the earth. Give us grace to do your will in all that we undertake our works may find favor in your sight. Have compassion on those who suffer from any grief or trouble, that they may be delivered from their distress. Give to the departed eternal rest, that light perpetual shine upon them. We praise you for your saints who have entered into joy, and we also come to share in your heavenly kingdom. Let us pray for our own needs and those of others. Lord our God, accept the fervent prayers of your people, and the multitude of your mercies look with compassion upon us and all who turn to you for help. For you are gracious, O lover of souls, and to you we give glory, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Let us confess our sins against God and our neighbor. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry, and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy on you. Forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ. Strengthen you in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. The peace of the Lord be always with you. And also with you. Walk in love as Christ loved us, and gave himself for us, an offering and sacrifice to God. <laughs>
and also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give him thanks and praise. It is right and a good and joyful thing, always and everywhere, to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth, because you gave Jesus Christ, your only Son, to be born for us, who by the mighty power of the Holy Spirit was made perfect man in the flesh of the Virgin Mary, his mother, so that we might be delivered from the bondage of sin and receive power to become your children. Therefore we praise you, joining our voices with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, who forever sing this hymn to proclaim the glory of your name. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. We give thanks to you, O God, for the goodness and love which you have made known to us in creation, in the calling of Israel to be your people, in your word spoken through the prophets, and above all, in the word made flesh, Jesus, your Son. For in these last days you sent him to be incarnate from the Virgin Mary, to be the Savior and Redeemer of the world. In him you have delivered us from evil, and made us worthy to stand before you. In him you have brought us out of error into truth, out of sin into righteousness, out of death into love. On the night before he died for us, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread, and when he had given thanks to you, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. After supper, he took the cup of wine, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Therefore, according to his command, O Father, we remember his death, we proclaim his resurrection, we await his coming in glory, and we offer our sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving to you, O Lord of all, presenting to you from your creation this bread and this wine. We pray, you gracious God, to send your Holy Spirit upon these gifts, that they may be the sacrament of the body of Christ and his blood of the new covenant. Unite us to your Son in his sacrifice, that we may be acceptable through him, being sanctified by the Holy Spirit. In the fullness of time, put all things in subjection under your Christ, and bring us to that heavenly country where, with the Blessed Virgin Mary, St. Joseph, her spouse, and all your saints, we may enter the everlasting heritage of your sons and daughters. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, the firstborn of all creation, the head of the Church, and the author of our salvation. By him, and with him, and in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. Amen. And now, as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and bless us, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen.
Lamb of God, you take away the sins of the world. Have mercy on us. Lamb of God, you take away the sins of the world. Have mercy on us. Lamb of God, you take away the sins of the world. Grant us peace. The gifts of God for the people of God. In union, O Lord, with your faithful people at every altar of your church, where the Holy Eucharist is now being celebrated, I desire to offer to you praise and thanksgiving. I remember your death, Lord Christ. I proclaim your resurrection. I await your coming, O Lord. Since I cannot receive you today in the sacrament of your body and blood, I beseech you to come spiritually into my heart. Cleanse and strengthen me with your grace, Lord Jesus and let me never be separated from you. May I live in you and you in me, in this life and in the life to come. Amen. Let us pray. Lord of all, we thank you for gathering us as your people. We call to remembrance the many times we have been fed at your table, and we lament our distance now. Be present, Lord Jesus, as you are present with your disciples. Be known to us in the breaking of the bread. And may your Holy Spirit sustain us and all your church until we can gather together again. We ask this for the sake of your love. Amen. The peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God, and of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, be among you and remain with you always. Amen. Amen. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God.